Great to see so many new faces here this afternoon. Um, I thought what I would do is, this is the third session in a series of three afternoon sessions this week. Um, it's been a very intense and, and a really great week and lots of discussion and ideas in our house. But I thought for the, for the benefit of those perhaps who weren't here the last two sessions, I would just touch on for me uh, what's at least in my head from, from the last couple of days. Um, I think it's always difficult uh, being an outsider and presenting projects that are happening elsewhere uh, to understand how they might resonate in this context here. But I think one of the things for me that seems to be um, very uh, resonant to me is the question of power. The question of uh, where we get our power from to make the decisions that we make, how we claim power. Uh, and how we do so when we're working in public space outside of buildings that are identified as art institutions. Uh, how we make new rules. Um, and do we make new rules by breaking down the old ones or by smuggling in sort of new ones? Uh, I think some of the things that have come through very clearly have been about the ideas of how artists suggest things that had never been imagined before. So suggest new ways of living together, new ways of working together. Uh, Anna here, who's uh, the uh, Danish uh, resident artist, Kevin Kuma, asked a, a brilliant question yesterday, which was around uh, you know, whether or not there's a certain types of artistic practice are, are safe, if you like, or kind of slightly, I guess, loss of generation, as opposed to perhaps those practices which are more critically active. And I guess my answer to that, and something I hope we'll explore more today, is uh, we have to be careful not to fall into a certain sort of orthodoxy of particular types of artistic practice. Russ and I in lunch today were talking about how urban gardening has become the new orthodoxy of a certain type of public art commissioning. Um, and so we'll be talking today about how as curators and producers, you know, this is very difficult. Uh, one selects artists, chooses to work in certain ways, with certain approaches, that become very popular. And as a result, we have invitations to do those kinds of projects again. The question is how can an institution or a, a, a producer-like situation continually stretch its limits, reinvent different ways of working, thereby perhaps effect change. Daphne asked a brilliant question yesterday around whether or not in Oslo we were perhaps working within the space that we were given. And we'll be stretching the limits of the possible within the regeneration context of the city of Oslo. And Beata and I had a, a really interesting conversation about that over yesterday evening. We were talking about how sometimes it's really hard when you present these projects because you you want to, you want to uh, really indicate actually what it takes to convince a funder and a developer to make a work that's going to last for a hundred years. That was a, a project by an artist called Katie Patterson called Future Library. It's all it's impossible to do, and you succeed in doing it. But the danger is, once you've succeeded, that you perhaps rest on your laurels, as we would say in English. You don't continue to stretch the limits of what's possible in that space. So I, what I really valued about Daphne's comment was saying, okay, so future farmers have made an extraordinary thing happen in Oslo. They've taken over an area and cre are creating a new bake house and a series of allotments. What next? How do you infiltrate the minds of the developers and those in power in Oslo to change thinking about how our food is produced in our city? So I, I really valued that. Okay, what next? What next? Push yourself. So today, uh, I, it's my uh, great pleasure uh, to welcome Herr Gunnar in Trierba, um, who is my colleague in Oslo. Uh, Herr Gunnar was on the selection committee uh, to appoint the curator for the Slow Space Oslo program, so he's been invested in that program for a long time. One of the wonderful things in Oslo is that Herr Gunnar acts as a critical frame to the project. So that means uh, I test ideas out on him. Uh, he gives me quite a lot of feedback on how things are going. 
but he's also my person on the ground. So because I'm not based in Norway, I'm based in the UK in Bristol, it's a, a curator who's able to tell me how things are changing, how, how is this translating into a different context. So I really appreciate the award. He was also the founding director of the Kunsthal Oslo, which is also part of the Guillermo project. So we thought today what we would do is we want to share with you and explore with you the idea of the future artist for duty. The title of today's talk is A Provocation in the Gallery Day. And the, uh, the contemporary art sector and gallery sector is very strong. We're not about to see the disappearance of uh, galleries and buildings. But what that question allows us to do perhaps is say, what are the different ways of supporting artists, of archiving and researching their work and the ideas that were generated as a result? What are the ways in which art institutions and uh, uh, what kind of other models exist now? And I think that's particularly fantastic to have that discussion in the context of itself, um, where it's been and where it's going and how that relates to some of the institutions we've been involved in. So uh, I'm going to, Kevin is going to uh, introduce a couple of models. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about situations, and uh, then I hope to have a, a wider discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. You can all hear me? Yeah. Uh, a bit louder. It's a bit louder. I'm talking straight into the mic now, so maybe you should, if possible, turn, turn it up. up. OK. Uh, as Claire said, uh, we're going to start with a presentation of Kunsthal Oslo, which is still running. I, I left the space, but uh, I'm still in contact with it. It's now run by Will Bradley. Uh, it was initiated in 2010, and it's a very untypical uh, art institution in, in many ways, I will say, but then again, I'm involved. So, uh, As Anne Beato said yesterday, uh, the Kunsthalle was it initiated due to the fact that this district, as you see here, Bjørvika in Oslo, is under development, and as part of the development project, it is put aside a sum of money that is meant for public art. Uh, but instead of investing all this money into permanent structures, architectonically, sculpture, and so forth, uh, we suggested a new model for the developers, saying, why don't you put aside, a, take some of this money that is meant for public art and create a program, an art institution that can run a program in this area. Uh, that has never been done before in Norway. So it was a, a new proposal, a new idea, and uh, they agreed upon it. And Kunsthal Oslo was initiated. And they have their own space. Even though it's called Kunsthal, it's rather small. Uh, I guess Salt is much, much bigger. <laughs> But it has a convenient gallery space, and this has been running now for four years. But during this time, the Kunsthal Oslo always had uh, a need or a wish to challenge their own institutional space. So, in addition to running traditional, if you can use that term, exhibitions within the space, we also launched and initiated IDS that connected the Kunsthalle to other environments outside the gallery. So that the gallery space becomes like a base, but in addition to this space, there are several activities <coughs> that took, has been taking place and that has involved uh, other kinds of audiences. Um, as you see here, it's a very peculiar uh, <laughs> architectonical structure. It's very new. Within these buildings, there are now uh, approximately 10,000 people working, and Kunsthalle is uh, located on the, the black building, a third to the left. So it means that the neighborhood foremost consists of banks, insurance companies, where people are working. There are people living in these buildings, but there are not many. So we have, the Kunsthalle is foremost connected to a milieu where people enter the space at 9 o'clock, 8 o'clock, and even 6 uh, or 5 o'clock in the evening. It's a very homogeneous milieu. It's very, for most artists and curators an untypical environment to communicate with because it's, it's so connected to business. But you should be aware of that behind this building there is a much more diverse um, city. And the nearby 
milieus consist of uh, uh, existing uh, blocks uh, and uh, small city centers that has uh, a much greater variety. So the Kunsthalle had always this sort of double challenge, being able to communicate to people working in the, in the neighborhood and at the same time trying to escape this and also communicate with other people in the nearby uh, environment. Yeah, one thing perhaps we yeah. should say about the topography of, of Oslo is quite interesting. It's, it's uh, very segregated between east and west. So there's a, there's a river in between. On the west side, it's very wealthy, and on the east side, tends to be immigrant communities. Yeah, surrounded by the forest. So yeah. you, you have this, it's quite a, you know, if you go there, there's kind of market, uh, markedly sort of different experience of the city, isn't there, in the west yeah. to the east. Yeah. And uh, so this sits really between the west and the east. It's behind, the city is behind it. Yeah. And yeah. Feel, we're, we're sort of sitting on the field of that. Uh, it's correct, as you say, Claire. But then again, what makes it a bit more complicated is because of the new investment in the East. The East has also become more diverse in a way because all these new uh, mini skyscrapers uh, containing insurance companies and banks. And, and in addition to that, there are three, at least, major uh, cultural institutions planned, the opera, the library, uh, and the Monk Museum. So the new investment in the East has somehow uh, uh, challenged the idea of this, of this diverse city. But then again, Kloster Oslo have always tried to do both, to communicate with these people who work in, uh, in this building, and at the same time trying to make sense and, and be important for people that, were, that live in the nearby communities. We should say that, that imagine starting an institution from scratch. So it was a very particular choice that they made to set up something called Kunsthalle. You had a different, you had a different title for it, didn't you? Uh, yes, that's true. Uh, in the beginning, we wanted, uh, we had several titles. One title was instrument uh, to play with this potential role of being part of an instrumentalization. Another um, idea was to call it an art center and then uh, connected to the tradition of art centers that in the 60s and 70s was very important in, uh, at least in Scandinavia, uh, north of Europe maybe, I don't know if that's the same case in England. Or, but then again, the, the typical art center uh, connected other kinds of art and culture to uh, visual art. So it contains uh, theaters, uh, concert halls, films, so it was per se, a much more diverse sort of scene. So the art center kind of communicate that kind of wish to expand the, uh, the scope beyond the visual art. Yeah. And how, how did, uh, so the, the Oslo art scene is quite diverse, you know, it, it contains museums and artists run initiatives, and commercial galleries and some, some other kind of uh, Kunsthalle type spaces. How did you perceive this to be distinctive within that ecology. So setting up a new institution, there's only four of you, yeah, on the staff. Um, and so, why call it a Kunsthalle? What, what was going to be distinctive about it? One reason why we called it a Kunsthalle was uh, kind of pedagogical, because uh, then again, it's kind of never uh, north part of Europe. Kunsthalle sort of signalized a kind of neutral space, uh, often financed by the city, and there is, the main focus, the main aim, is somehow to exhibit art and to keep a strong dialogue with the audiences. And they have no collection, and there is no sort of private, uh, I mean, there is no commercial uh, economy that is very connected to it. So that's why we chose Kinsa, because it is an existing model. And it created some kind of perception or idea of what we were going to be. Uh, and we also touched yesterday on the fact that uh, this is you know, a very unusual model for a developer team. If you like, the queen five years worth of core funding to run a new art institution. But your co-director at the time, Will Bradley, wrote a, a really interesting article about his discomfort of accepting private money and also running a Kunst Tower in the, in the ground floor of a major corporate bank. How, how, what were the kinds of discussions that you had together about how complicit you were in uh, what we were talking about yesterday of uh, 
uh, delivering a sort of lipstick on the gorilla? How, how did you, what, why did you agree to accept that private money and, to, and that location for the concern? Yeah. Uh, then again, this money are not private because they are public money directed through companies that sort of behave as if they're private, but all the, almost all the companies that are connected to the Kunsthalle's economy are actually public. Uh, but they are, um, that's a new model of, you know, how do you run public institutions or, or businesses? You, you somehow organize them as if they were private companies. Uh, so, and that has also been important for us. And at the same time, we wanted a very strong um, structure that allows us to work completely freely in terms of programming. So we have a very strong board uh, where there are five members. Three of the members are strongly connected to the art scene and don't represent anybody but themselves. And two of the board members uh, are connected to the companies that actually own the So were there, tell, tell us a little bit about, give us some juice. So tell us a little bit about <laughs> the, you know, were there disagreements between you about, about how free you were? You know, so the, the, the program that you were going to run, I think Adam Yasser was mentioning yesterday that there was going to be no censorship of your program, but still, you know, I've always thought as I've walked past it that it sends a very particular signal to run that Kunsthalle in the, in the first floor of, uh, of that building. And, and that's something that we always kept in mind. So what we've been doing actually, even though it's a Kunsthalle, and I will show you concrete examples of this, uh, we took the role almost like a cultural center as well, and the program has always been, had a kind of criticality within it. It has always been kind of narrow uh, projects uh, that somehow kind of challenge the audience, uh, but there has been a variation of what we could call like um, uh, cold exhibitions and warm exhibitions. It's a term that you can use in Norway. I don't know if it makes sense in English, but... Cold and Cold and warm, meaning cold are the kind of the explicit, very sharp, uh, conceptual, uh, harder to understand exhibition for a general audience. And then warm exhibitions are much more generous and more uh, eager to communicate to a bigger audience. And we have been, we have made both, but never lost the integrity. And that's very important. And our owners have never interfered in anything. So we have been completely. Uh, independent, if that's possible. <laughs> uh, and actually the position that the Kunsthalle have taken in Oslo has been very strong due to the program. It's a kind of very distinct program. So maybe tell us a little bit about how the program unfolded. It's, if you can imagine it, it's almost like this, this organization became like a, a host, if that translates, like a, a, you know, on a, a sort of parasite somehow. Uh, Will Bradley has written about that, the, this notion of the art institution as a parasite. Uh, that sort of fixes itself onto something that it begins to eat away at. So it's, it's quite an interesting way in which that began to unfold. Yeah, I can show some examples. Um, this is from the, uh, the opening exhibition. One kind of key element that has always been a close uh, relation to the artist. So even the show had, the shows had been curated, it always has involved artists in the curation of the shows as well. Uh, but I, I'm not going to, uh, to go in depth on that. I'm going to move on because some exhibitions we've been doing. Sorry, this is really cheeky, but we're, we're having a cup of coffee. I just okay, really coffee's coming. Else. I, I just continue just talking. Keep uh, away. <laughs> so, I guess this is something you all know if you're within the art uh, business, even if you're an artist or you're a gallerist or producer or a curator, uh, you at some point you're kind of bored of your own space and the rhythm that the space always kind of demands of you. So you know that before an exhibition opens, there is a kind of hectic activity, there is a lot of energy in the space, expectation, nervosity, whatever. Then the exhibition over, and then nothing happens for like six weeks. Uh, and then it starts again. So it's like it's rhythm. Uh, and especially ex bigger institutions always need to keep that real because we have a long-term program. But at some point we, we thought, let's do something, let's do an, an exhibition that somehow breaks down these rules or challenges the rules. So we made an exhibition called Run Comrade, 
the old words behind you. And it actually is a slogan from 1968 Paris, uh, the student revolution in Paris. It's a very famous slogan that was sprayed on to walls. But uh, we transformed it into like a headline that emphasized artists or arts uh, interest for utopia, like for thinking differently, for being impatient, for moving on, for wanting something else. And, um, but the problem is that you can't thematize that. You can't make an exhibition with that as a theme. So instead of making a conventional exhibition, uh, we implemented that kind of attitude into the creation of the show and into the production of the show. So what we did was that every day a new artwork came into the show. So the exhibition opened with an empty space. Uh, there was one performance the first night. It was a uh, known uh, vision experimental musician. She did her performance and left her shoes in the gallery. That's her contribution. We had a rule saying that artists could leave or could not leave behind traces, depending on of what makes sense. So during this 22 days, I think, the exhibition uh, called, uh, evolved. Every day there was a new art object or happening introduced into the show. Sometimes they were kind of objects, paintings, but there were also performances, readings, dance, and at the end of this show, the last day, the show was completed, and then it closed. Uh, and then we had a finissage. So the, the end party, instead of having a finissage, we ended with this finissage. So every day there was a new art piece, and it also meant that every day there was a new opening. And new audiences came. Depending on what kind of project we show, there was a new audience. So every day a new audience came, and some came back. Some actually came back every day for 22 days. And what they saw was an, an exhibition that changed completely. And this is something we really didn't have figure out before. And that almost killed us. <laughs> it's that you can't just hang piece and then hang another one and hang another one. You had constantly to reorganize the space. So we had a team of three technicians that was constantly working, trying to create a new exhibition every day. I, I saw some of, the, of this. And as part of this exhibition, we escaped the gallery space as well. And some work was actually uh, shown outside, but were still included in the show. This is a uh, it's a piece that somehow also talks about the environment that we are in. It says, it's a, it's a sign, a typical sort of security sign, and it says, as you say, this area is under 23 hour video and audio surveillance. Uh, and it's made by uh, Ahmed Oud, I think it's correct, uh, yeah. So this was part of the exhibition, but it existed outside the space and became somehow kind of site related or context related and told you something about the area. This is another show, uh, sorry, another uh, uh, art project within that, underneath that headline. And it's, it was made by a Norwegian performance artist called Marianne Hay. And what we did was that we had access to the boardroom uh, of the company who sort of owns the building. Uh, and we used the boardroom to stage a performance where an, an actor, professional actor, uh, played a role of uh, administrative director, a businessman, talking about the concept of value. So what we did was that we guided the audience that came and thought they were going to see a uh, performance in the space. We guided them through up the building and into this uh, kind of massive boardroom and they were listening to this uh, director uh, somehow discussing the idea of value. And then, as some kind of remains of that performance, uh, there were uh, some kind of posters that he used as, some kind of, uh, as part of a narrative, and they were exhibited in the exhibition. So here again, we left our own space. We kind of smuggled 
approached it into the boardroom of the company that owns the building, and also made a kind of different meeting between the art audience and the people working in the office. So they were, the office workers were there? Some of them That's were there, yeah. Yeah. So this is all just to show you some examples. Another example of what we've been doing is this exhibition. Yeah. It, it's a very conventional show, uh, show, but it has a very peculiar concept. It was a totally democratic exhibition. Uh, we announced in all papers, everybody who wants to exhibit a work of art can do it in our space. Uh, the only restriction is that you need to get the work inside the door. And we put a restriction on about 150, between 150 and 200 pieces, and then we, we closed the, um, the participation list because the space couldn't handle more work. So what happened was that uh, we had a massive uh, response, and the strange thing was that, and an interesting thing was that Meetings between a highly professionalized art uh, group, semi-amateur, real amateurs, people in their 90s, a woman who was 19 year old came, uh, kids came to exhibit their drawings. So it was a, um, a very, very different kind of, uh, I would say, meeting and setting. Uh, and that is to do with the fact that this kind of, kind of radical democracy happened. In a way. What was the motivation for that? Because it could be read as a deeply cynical gesture to, if it was in the UK, it would be seen as a deeply cynical gesture to expand your audience, you know. Yeah. And but to, <laughs> but I, I suspect, knowing you guys, that 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 you know that there's less of a that there's less of an onus on you to report back uh, audience statistics and various no, things. We don't need to report audience. No. You don't need to do no. it. So, no. so what what? And in a, in a sense, what's interesting about that is that sounds to me like an artistic gesture, an artistic yeah. project, yeah. and yet it was a curatorial yeah. one. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about where, where was the motivation for that? How did that discussion come about to decide to do that as an exhibition? In a way, it was connected to a specific day, which is called the Open Day, uh, where the whole area is open for public. So there are thousands of people walking through the area to visit different institutions and spaces and just to see the development of the area. So it was like a, a response to the fact that there was going to be a massive audience in the streets, and also the fact that, then again, it's kind of taboo in a way, because uh, if you, as an art institution, uh, give away this kind of uh, curatorial, uh, you know, an artistic sort of integrity, and say everybody can come, we were kind of attracted just to see what's going to happen. Uh, so it was more like an experiment uh, to test out the possibility. What happens if we do it and can we manage it? And it, it has a duration of only one day. So I think that's also, it, it has a limited, and it's something you can't do on a regular basis. So because the program is highly defined and in general are looked upon as kind of challenging, this became, Sort of like the opposite. Maybe we could, uh, when we come on a bit yeah. later, we yeah. can think about um, the art. In, yes, yeah, sorry, let's see. Can, yeah. you, can you follow up with yeah. your question? Yeah. 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 It's only for one day. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a one off. Yeah. It, 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 it was the idea Maybe to repeat it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how does it. How does it work with, uh, with, with respect to the rest of the program? Uh, with, with respect to uh, the, uh, the institution's general program, that is to say, if you have, I don't know, I hire an artist one day, and then the next day you have that, and then the third day you have gardeners, or whatever it may be, uh, what would you say about the longevity of the program and what the institution does? That's one question. And perhaps uh, the second question would be, you know, if I want to take a train, I would rather have a Engineers manage my program. Uh, that's just to keep that in mind. You know, there, 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 there are certain limits to artistic license. Uh, and but not that you cannot do it, you always can try their own thing, but you know, I'd rather take someone that is managed by a kind of, you know, uh, airplane engineers or whatever. Uh, 
the other antagonist is this, this is the topic today is the gallery of dead and future reality situation that I mean I'm not thinking of obviously not the gallery as a physical space I think we go further but for example why did you not do this exhibition all around the city on this on that very day where everybody would open their homes or gardens or I don't know displayed outside or whatnot that the whole place would become kind of an expanded idea of uh, what people produce in the city, rather than condensing it back to something which has white walls and a particular kind of Yeah, um, This open day is connected to this specific uh, part of the city. So it, it's not uh, an open day in, in the city as such. So it's very connected and experienced as something peculiar that um, people will learn Think about when it comes to this part of the city, but I agree. It's a, uh, the reason why we could do it and still uh, keep some kind of what call it, integrity or, or a profile is because it was uh, an exception in a way. It, it was for us an attempt to try something different and also to experience what it means. But it could be criticized for being cynical. But nobody actually, well, at least we didn't experience any reaction that sort of tended to go that way. And what was also interesting that the audience that came that day, some also came later. So it was a, a way of uh, getting in touch with a different kind of audience that actually uh, visited us again. Uh, I, I had a take on it that might be interesting here, which is that I think, I think the interesting thing that Kim Sellers have done and Eastside Projects in Berlin, which is similar, is that I, what I see you doing in that first year's program at least is that in a, in a way, it's a bit of a testing ground. And if it's a testing ground, then you need to do it within uh, the, the given parameters. Uh, so the given parameter is the white cube. Right? So what I see them doing is that it's very important that they're within the gallery, because otherwise it's kind of doing it, it's a different kind of project. So I, I, I see what happening, uh, you know, there, there's certain criticisms I would make, of, uh, particularly that, that day, I think, uh, I don't, I'd agree with its motivations, but I think that what is interesting is that you chose to say, let's let's make actually a, a Kunsthalle that seems to look like a Kunsthalle, and that's important. We made we made this space look like a white cube, so that we can then play with the assumptions of what a white cube does. Yeah, because if you if actually what you've done is create a different kind of space to show art, it wouldn't be a testing ground in the same way. So I. I because I think initially when you set up Kutzel Oslo, I was like, why are they calling it a Kutzel? And why, why are they building it like a white cube? Why don't you do something else with it? But then I can kind of see over time what that did because you needed, you needed um, some boundaries yeah. to, to, to test against and kick against. Oh, yeah. uh, of course, it has to do with the friction that creates yeah. towards the established idea of what a Kutzel is and um, challenging that. Yeah. And, and, but then again, but there's a risk with it, of course, because in order to do that, you have to do your adverts and freeze, and you, you, you know, there's a risk that it then just becomes a, a, a standard art institution. That that's the risk for the Kunsthaus future, I think, is that it's a gallery like any other. Yeah. But there are actually, I mean, both architectonically and the way the Kunsthaus in Oslo is run, it somehow is not. Uh, it kind of challenged the typical idea of what the Kunsthaus is. Uh, but I can go further on. Uh, just to a question. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. There is a the risk of kind of called exhaustion or fatigue that you actually the audience uh, can't cope with it because it's too massive in a way. But then again, this exhibition was very limited in, in time; it was 20 second days. So, but of course, we, we thought it through, and uh, then again, there were, as I said, different 
kind of artistic practice that was included in the program. So it wasn't just visual art, it was also a performance, uh, authors, musicians, uh, and the program gathered different kinds of audience depending on uh, what kind of was on that day. And then it was a general audience that came because they followed the Kunsthalle on a regular basis. Uh, so, I, I wanted uh, to, to take your point there. I wanted to bring us to perhaps a wide, slightly wider discussion, um, which is around um, uh, a certain critical discourse that emerged in the art field in, about a decade ago, which is called New Institutionalism, which uh, Vass is an is a, is a art of and, and I think in some of the discussions that we've both had in the past. And, and this was a, a series of um, critical discussions, talks, research papers amongst um, curatorial directors, curators and institutions, mostly across Northern Europe, um, which started uh, uh, probably, if, if you know any of these people, um, Maria Lind, uh, the curator named Maria Lind, was a kind of exponent of this. And it led to all sorts of galleries and museums and art institutions uh, to test out uh, what an art institution could be. Uh, and that affected things like uh, their communications tactics and departments, uh, the length and duration of exhibitions, so that the kind of unfolding exhibition, one work after another, or uh, uh, the way in which works would be left as kind of residue you know, from one exhibition to another became a kind of format. People played with their typefaces and their logos uh, and their branding. Um, Charles Escher was probably someone that became very well known for that as well known. But then something happened. There was a kind of fatigue in the art world and a backlash against this sort of testing out of what an art institution and a gallery could be. And the backlash came from those curators and institutions who said, the problem is with these kind of testing out methods is it takes us away from the work of artists. It's kind of like curators playing the game of artists. Um, as opposed to, and then the, there were arguments between both camps. There was, on the one hand, someone like Charles Escher would say, well, the point is, is that I'm trying to create an art institution which is responding to the new ways in which artists are working. And our structures and our methods of communicating don't fit anymore the ways in which artists are creating artworks. But uh, what we've seen happen is that places, certainly in the UK, like Baltic, Whitechapel, Serpentine, etc., that played with new institutionalism about five, ten years ago, they've gone back, in a sense, to standard formats, like exhibitions that are on for a certain period of time and then taken down and then the next exhibition comes. But what we do see uh, a little bit still it, it is this sort of cross art form now. More galleries and institutions uh, at the Serpentine had things like, you know, the Marathons, um, we've had some of the Fogbys, but there's more insistence on the artist's work, musician's work, dancer's performance, than there is on playing with the structures and mechanics of art institutions. So, so Kunsan also is interesting in the, in the point at which it came into being, which is 2010, which is kind of on the tail end of new institutionalism, when, when other galleries were kind of going back to more conventional formats, I would say. But that had a very particular, a very particular context in Oslo that hadn't really been done in Oslo before. No, and also I, I completely agree on what you said, and it has been an ongoing discussion, but I think what what makes Kunsthalle not a typical example of new institutionalism is that we always had uh, the work and the communication with artists as a very, has always been very close, connected to artists, and, and artists have always been involved in the curation. Like this project here, we gave the space away to a group of artists that was running a program for a, a month. Uh, it's kind of school they have created. Uh, it's an ongoing uh, project, and we somehow trust artists and give space. So even though there is a, cur a curatorial creativity here, it, it never, I think, never somehow overruns the, uh, you know, the importance of presenting art uh, and being concerned uh, about what artists needs. And also, I think, uh, 
I really somehow uh, wish to, to communicate to a bigger audience. So, because the danger with new instit the way that new institutionalism sort of went was that it became very self-concerned in a way. It becomes like an art institution that doesn't need any audience and artists because it's actually its own purpose in a way. Uh, and I don't feel that the Kunsthalle somehow falls under that kind of uh, umbrella in a way. Yeah. But, but I'm very interested in your use of the term giving away. Because it could be seen that an idea of uh, of aggressive art institution. I think this comes back to Vasu's point about expertise and professionalism and engineers like making the claim, uh, which is that um, why do we feel the need as curators or producers or art, uh, directors and institutions to to give away the decision making? Um, why uh, do you? Is it about um, democratizing your processes of selection is that kind of what you're saying is is it that uh, you that sounds like another kind of experiment in a way so what what happened as a result of giving away that that month because it's still just come back to Daphne's point yesterday in a sense it's still giving that artist group a space that's defined to say you can do what you want but it's in the space for a month it's not to reinvent the institution or help us run it or change the funding mechanism or close it down. And it's still to do something within some defined parameters, isn't it? Uh, uh, maybe a giveaway is not the correct English term, it's due to my bad English. But, <laughs> no, uh, no, it's an interesting, <laughs> it's an interesting yeah. term. Yeah. 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 But um, talking about this project in specific, uh, the reason why we gave away the space to the, this artist group, because it, we had an, an interest in that, in curatorial interest, it's, a, it's an interesting program they're doing, and we also um, wanted to see how their program could kind of respond to the fact um, that they were going to be inside our exhibition space, because before they've been elsewhere, they've been in the forest, uh, they've been uh, around in the city doing similar projects, but they've never been into a, like a, an art institution before. So, so, so what did they do? Tell us a bit about what, well, what did they do? They, they run a school, actually. They, it's called a summer school, and they create a, a school uh, program that is open and you can join as a student or whatever. Uh, and the program consists of, of uh, kind of traditional lectures and meetings with others, and they also constantly produce uh, exhibitions, uh, workshops. Yeah. So it has. <laughs> At some point, it's public, and at some point, it's it's closed in a way. And and did that did they? I'm interested to have some of these projects. Uh, what was the legacy on them? So were your working processes affected by what they did in their during that month? Uh, sorry, um, um, so they ran a school, yeah. and so they then left. Yeah. So some of the contacts and uh, relationships they established, yeah. were they continued? Of course, the same. Yeah. Yeah. And actually some of the artists that was part of this group has all exhibit later. Yeah. So it's, it's an ongoing program. It's not something that's completely finished and, and just disappeared. It's somehow uh, embedded into uh, the history and also in the archive of the Kunsthalle. And, and, yeah. uh, I showed you another thing which is important. The Kunsthalle also uh, has a bookshop. Uh, the bookshop is uh, it's called Torpedo. Uh, it's run by two persons, and it's a separate uh, organization, a non-commercial uh, bookshop. Uh, we were given the space for free, and we thought we could actually use that as an opportunity to uh, also be uh, generous and also invite other people in the, to, to be part of this program and project. So they've been with us from from the opening, uh, and it has been really important both for them and for us. They were, being, they were being closed down, weren't they? No, they, were, they had to move. At, yeah, when we had... met them in 2010, they had a space that was uh, threatened uh, because the building was supposed to be demolished. So we asked them to join us and to re-establish Torpedo. Uh, and they've been there since, and they also, even though they, have, they are specialized, specialists within art, uh, visual culture, theory, philosophy, uh, they in fact also uh, attract another audience. And sometimes we collaborate, it means that we, we uh, create exhibitions or presentations that also include uh, 
program that connects to the to, 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 to PIDO. So it ha it's really like a symbiosis in a way. Uh, we also do work outside the Kunsthalle. Like I'll show you one work. Uh, it's Yumana Mana. It's, uh, it's a sculpture. It's called For Those Who Likes the Smell of Burning Tires. Uh, and it consists of uh, found objects, Norwegian beautiful flagpoles that, that she found. And they're twisted into this kind of strange kind of uh, it's kind of anti sculpture <laughs> project. Uh, and the reason why she wanted to be in this specific spot is because this spot at that moment was the only spot in the neighborhood that hasn't been developed. So it was like a non place within the very uh, developed area. There was still one spot that hasn't somehow, due to the speed of the process and any practical reasons, this spot wasn't developed. So it became like, like a pocket in this area. And it has some kind of subversive, uh, it's possible to read it in many ways. Uh, but it was a temporary sculpture. Now it has been removed and uh, at the moment it's going to be put up elsewhere in the city. Yeah. I, I think that's a really, uh, it's a really great description of Kutsala. Uh, I wonder if, uh, you could uh, s summarize really for me what for you were your failures? Because you're no longer the director of Kunsthalle, so you've gone freelance, and you you know you established this organization, uh, and uh, that you know you've succeeded. It, it, it has a future, <laughs> so uh, that that's a, that's a huge success in these kind of times. But what for you didn't go right? What for you was a frustration? What for you, in all that testing and experiment, did you think, why did you decide to to go freelance and to work mm. on public projects? That's <laughs> kind of complicated. Other thing. than personal stuff. That's personal. <laughs> but, uh, no, but I think that uh, one thing that I wish came through is that the Kunsthalle, uh, we have a financial problem. Uh, I would say we, we are like a bonsai tree, you know? Uh, you know, a bonsai tree? It's very developed, uh, extremely sort of neat, but small. Uh, in terms of that, the, the budget never increases. We are running on the same budget all the year round. So we never are able to expand in a way that we wish. It doesn't mean we want a bigger space, but it means we might want to make more you know, uh, complex exhibition that was more difficult to finance. So it, some of the financial situation creates a, a situation where uh, you never escape your, uh, your position in a way. And I, should, I, I wish that that could change because the Kunsthalle has the potential of being even more important in Oslo maybe, but uh, it's small. Uh, but then again, doesn't mean, I mean I don't, I'm not longing for a huge space, but more money to program, to make uh, interesting uh, complex exhibitions. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would just finish with one example also to show that for the Kunsthalle it has been important also to collaborate with other institutions in Oslo. And one of our major collaboration partners has been the public library. Uh, we discovered that one of the, uh, the, the central public library in Oslo, which is a beautiful building, they had uh, a space, a beautiful space from the 30s that hasn't been um, in use in many ways, it's kind of empty, but it's a classic, uh, like a seminar room. Uh, they don't have the capacity to program it, so we offered uh, uh, them uh, our kind of curatorial knowledge and, and you know, pro experience when it comes to producing programs, and said we can program this space for you uh, as a collaboration. Uh, <coughs> And we've been doing that since. So, uh, like once a month, it has been a new, either a lecture, a performance, uh, a workshop, kind of, I would say, varied in a way what we've been doing. That. And what's interesting that, and that is that the collaboration between the library and the Kunsthalle is still going on and has somehow reinforced. So now when the library is moving, 
to the new, uh, much bigger accept, uh, space in the Bjørvika. Kunsthalle might be still with it. And if you're looking long into the future, and this is just a speculation, maybe the Kunsthalle, maybe uh, the final, uh, the final uh, location for the Kunsthalle is in the library. Uh, because originally we had that as an idea, and we actually had a long dialogue with the library that when we established the Kunsthalle, we imagined a Kunsthalle inside the library, uh, and to use the library space as some kind of you know, point of departure. Uh, that didn't work out due to practical reasons, but there was an interest from the library side as well. So maybe in 10 years from now on, maybe the Kunsthalle is in the new library. But this is just speculation, and it's a utopian idea, I know, but we are, Kunsthalle has been interested in that, and the library has shown uh, us an interest. So. Can you flip onto the, not that one, onto the red side, just come out? Yeah. Um, so the I, I'm interested in, uh, think, in thinking about Kunsthalle, if you just click on to go, I'm interested in, in thinking about Kunsthalle, what it allows us to do is think about how institutions are born. <laughs> you know, it's kind of rare these days, uh, you seem in some ways to have two different poles. One is either an artist-run initiative that bubbles up and disappears. Maybe after a few years, after the energy goes or people move on, or you have a long-standing gallery or arts institution with a very long history. So when these new art institutions bubble up that have a long life, maybe five to ten years, in case the situation is 11 years, uh, it's interesting to think about um, how they, uh, what models they decide to take on, what models they reject. Uh, in some ways they're defined by what they try not to be, but also about the partnerships that they create that influence uh, the model of art institution you get. In the case of um, situations, uh, I, I wanted to just share with you um, yeah, that'd be cool. um, how uh, situations began. It began as part of a university. So uh, I think, as I said on Tuesday, I uh, was a gallery curator at uh, various places, um, uh, public galleries like Icon Gallery in Birmingham. And, uh, set up situations within the University of Bristol uh, on a two-day a week research fellowship. And it was a two-year pilot project, and I was interested in there being a commissioning agency, so a bit like a small art angel or creative time, uh, set within a university. So what it would mean is we would produce projects, but we would also do research and learn and write and publish as a result of those projects, and that would feed this kind of ongoing program. I never conceived of it as an institution or an organization. It was a my own kind of curatorial research at the time, but as ever with these things. And I ask you, what initiated yeah. their contact with the university? Why did you start to work with them? Oh, God. Uh, because it's, it's not I typical needed, thing. No, I approached them, and I kind of, uh, it was one of those funny things of how these things happen where I had a have a coffee with someone and I said, is there any job going at the university? And they said, oh, no, not really. We've got this sort of two day a week thing. And I said, well, I'm interested in setting this up. And they said, oh, well, we'll have to advertise. You're not the university, but we'll have to advertise. So I went through a three month process, by which time I was heavily pregnant. So I'm sitting in this interview, like eight months pregnant, saying, I want to set up this new program. <laughs> they were like, when can you start? And I said, um, three months time. So two months after having my first child, I set up this, this new program. But um, it, was, it was very much from the point of view of, uh, we were just trying something out. And um, it was at a time when I, I, there was no funding. Um, so I had to raise everything from scratch. But um, it, it was a two year pilot. And then, and then what happened was the university understood the value of having a program that was working outside of the university. And then what started to happen was as a result of uh, this book, Contemporary Art from Studio to Situation. Um, uh, then I started to get asked to do international projects, and then I hired a staff, and then it started to turn into an organization. 
but, but it's very interesting because when I've talked to colleagues of mine that have similar public art producing uh, programs, they said, why did, you, why, why did you set up a kind of hierarchical situation where you're a director and you have a curator and producer of communications? And I said, you know what, that, that's just my training. That's, that's how I learned for an institution to operate. I feel comfortable with that. I feel comfortable with working within a creative team, but it's not, it's not an artist-run initiative. I'm, I'm not an artist. I didn't train as an artist. I, I'm an art historian and a curator, and that's the, the kind of hierarchical structure I feel comfortable with. Um, but the, it, one of the interesting things about um, being in, born in a university is it means situations had in its DNA le uh, learning. So it meant that uh, even when we left the university in 2012, that we have this thing in our projects and in the way that we work, which is that we're always asking questions of how we're working and what the impact of what we're doing is. Um, but my, my training, I guess, as a curator in public galleries was that I was very passionate about asking questions of who this work was for, who, artists, uh, who we were reaching with, uh, with the kind of work that we did. Was it originally meant as a institution that was supposed to produce public art? Yeah, it was, it was, it was always, that I, was, I was very interested in, um, I'll tell you a story of why, of why that emerged. When I was working in Birmingham, um, one of the things I was mentioning on Tuesday was that Icon Gallery got uh, one of the first big grants through the lottery in 1995 uh, to build a new gallery, refurbish a new gallery. So they moved out of their gallery that there was, closed the gallery down, and we're now two years in the city. And of course, at that point, I then started to work with artists outside of the gallery and completely thought, why on earth haven't I been doing this before? It's fantastic. You know, this is basically, you could do anything. You could work anywhere. You could have extraordinary impact with the work you were doing. Artists found it incredibly exciting to be inserting work in everyday situations. You could do things of scale, you could do things that were small interventions. Uh, it was a very, very exciting time. So I did two years of that before I went back in the gallery for another five years as a curator of exhibitions, and I missed it. I missed the dynamism that you got of working outside of the gallery. But, but as a result, uh, one of the things I noticed was uh, I was very interested in the way in which uh, artist would respond, a visiting artist would respond to a given concept. That, that's the initial question that I had, which was like, how does an artist from outside make work of relevance for a local situation? And then I started to ask that question of artists. So when I set up situations, that was the first lecture series that we did, which was listening to people like Catherine Davi, to um, talking with Eric Rogoff about the nature of sight and context. Uh, making work for different cultural contexts. Thomas Hirschman talking about the way in which he worked in response to sites and situations. Um, but then we also started to talk about urban planning and regeneration and the role that artists could play within that. So the program that developed was a, a portfolio of project strands, some of which lasted many years and some of which were very, very short. Now, if you look at the situation today, you really somehow expanded, and now you're active in many places, uh, not only Bristol. How do you find the sort of the fact that you've been you grown and that you you're active, for instance, in Oslo, uh, which is kind of far away? Can you say something about the challenge of producing work uh, in other contexts than than where you are situated? Yeah, it's really hard. I mean, I would say that um, there's a kind of, uh, Lara was making a really good question yesterday, which was about um, how can you be adaptive? So how, how, what are the models of art institutions that are adaptive? And, I, you know, we, we only have a team of six for situations, and then we grow when we do a big project. And um, one of the things that's very, very important is that we adapt to opportunities that come up. And um, for quite a long time, we did small, smaller scale public art commissions. And then I got really fed up with being a kind of service provider. 
And I, I, I just realized that what we weren't doing was kind of, we didn't kind of have a checklist to say, should we work on this project? You know, is this artist going to be really compromised in this situation? Can we create space here to do something different, to change people's minds, to, to really uh, bring in an artist that no one would expect in this situation? And so we, we, over the last three years, we've slowly started to do more of our own initiative projects and less of the uh, public art consultancy projects. And so in response to working um, remotely, in 2008 to 9, we did that project, One Day Sculpture, in New Zealand. And it was really, really, really hard because all the meetings would be at 2 in the morning in the UK. So I would kind of get on my Skype, sitting in my pajamas, and they'd be sort of sitting there having a meeting. And um, I had a project team over there, so I was directing them remotely. And, but what I learned from that experience was that I had a co-director, and that was crucial. So that was similar to in Oslo, where Anna Beata and myself are, are, are my colleagues on the ground. So I, I think it's really, really hard if you're working remotely and you don't have uh, a team on the ground. But I do wonder about the future. Um, so, so just to say, first of all, about Oslo, I think the unusual thing about Oslo is the opportunities that it's given us to test out projects that have never been done before there, and um, therefore it would, if it was offered to me again in the same terms, it would definitely um, meet our checklist, if you like. But um, what has happened for situations is that we've put down more roots now in Bristol, and we're having more influence on the future of the arts in Bristol, um, because I'm able to take more of a role there. Um, and they under we sort of find the language to describe what it is that we do city. I wonder if that's similar here, whether there's, I don't know whether there's a similar thing in how you, you talk about your value as an institution or an organisation to the city. And one thing they understand us is that we're a cultural export. So they understand us as a, a bit like a film producer. So we, we may be based in Bristol, but we work, we export our expertise elsewhere. So they, they talk in those kind of commercial terms, but actually it's quite a good way of describing what we do. So Bristol is a, is a, is a sort of seedbed that nurtures that um, expertise. But I do wonder for the future about uh, the carbon footprint of lots of international projects and flights, etc. And secondly, uh, I'm, I, I'm not sure, I, I think we'd have to be very, very careful how many international projects we took on because, because this kind of work takes, you have to get embedded, you have to get under the skin of a place. And you really need to be there to do that. One thing that just came into my mind, and it's also like a, something that concerned me as well, is that many of these projects, or almost all of them, kind of follows their development. And so it means that there is something, there is a financial source, and there is a development. And that art is sort of concentrated around developments. So if, if you go to Oslo, for instance, now, there is a lot of art in Bjørvika because the development is in Bjørnika. So uh, then it's a potential critique of this kind of practice that it somehow art becomes equal to development in a way. And uh, is it sometimes a need to do project that has a different financial sort of source? Or, or do you in situation also sometimes do self-initiate projects? Or? Yeah, we do. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think about um, we initiate uh, more and more uh, projects where we, we will direct invitation to an artist. But the reality is, I don't know if it's the same here, the reality is often what happens is that funding follows a particular opportunity. Okay, So next year, Bristol has be is going to become European green capital, right? which essentially means it's a, it, it's, the, it's a celebration of sustainability and the environment. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a massive thing within Europe a really big thing for Bristol. But what it means, Bristol, culturally speaking, is that the government want to put a lot of money into culture that year uh, because they recognize they want cultural celebration to be a part of European green capital. It happens in so many different ways. It happens with the Olympics. It happens with, with all these different sort of cultural celebrations. So on the one hand, I would say the situation is placed to take advantage of that, to say, so we've said, that's great, we wanted to do a project with Piazza Gates. 
So we're going to do it as part of European Green Capital. And it gives us the opportunity to apply for the money to do a project we were wondering if we were going to do anyway. On the other hand, however, the danger with those celebrations and those kind of branded cultural tourism projects and events is, is that they don't, there's a, there's a danger that they don't nurture the existing arts ecology. And then it's like a kind of circus going through town. So you get the money for this year, but next year, forget it. <laughs> so you have to find a way, as a clever organization, to uh, bring that money in and maybe pay for things the following year. You know, find a way of being very clever to respond to those things. It, it goes back with the development, I would say. Is that it, it, it's a question of how an organization can um, have a very clear mission and vision of the artist it wants to work with without being directed and instrumentalized by those opportunities. So um, I, I guess one other thing to say about situations is the importance of, um, of two things, really. One is research and writing and thinking. So we have a, a publishing strand that's an important part of what we do, but also advocacy. So we are... Um, part of something called the European Network of Public Art Producers. It's only called the European Network because that's where the money comes from. It's actually an international network, really, which is, um, uh, it's actually not an institution. It doesn't have an administration hub. It's a network of individuals who work to create opportunities for artists to make work in public space. And part of the, the rules of public art that you've seen, that's part of trying to change the mindset of what public art is. So the, the network of public art producers uh, are working together to advocate for some of these ways of working. Don't underestimate that convincing funders and local authorities to put money into art projects that are temporary or uh, ephemeral or uh, not uh, physical objects is a very, very difficult thing to do. Um, and the only way we can convince them to do that and support artists to make unusual work is by showing them uh, what can happen when you invest it and trust in an artist. So uh, that's part of what uh, Situations is trying to do. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah, I forgot one more question, but maybe we can start somewhere. Which is, uh, I mean, really explain that there will be a lot of times of anger. Uh, part of that development anger is also the integration anger. We used to think before, I mean, before 1989, we used to all complain about uh, that, the, that the art world was not uh, lacked integration, vertical and horizontal in all ways, and it was only limited to Germany and USA and whatnot. And now integration is becoming a huge problem. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, and part of that the kind of integration because we think of is, is, is coupled with development. Yeah? Development of India, development of China, development of Doha, development of Sharjah, etc. etc. There is not another day that you open the international magazines and you hear about you know uh, which which uh, which uh, you know uh, queen did what which queen bought what in etc. etc. Et and why is it not and all of that stuff. So development is also I mean City development, uh, economic development, but also development on that that sort of situation was you know, completely sort of integrated art world of the haves rather than the have uh, So it is equally it's equally problematic, but uh, we kind of forget about it because we think it's, we are all in the same world at the moment. Uh, and the way you talk about development and all of that and, 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 and the relationship to uh, funders, be they private or public, that explains an extremely compromised, extremely compromised situation. And what, this is a common question, I mean, this is a collective question, I should say, it's not to, to you in particular, yeah. uh, in any way, but is it possible to imagine a future uh, within this, within this set of parameters? Is it, is it possible to actually uh, affect people who will affect the world differently within this set of parameters? Uh, can the art world have any claim any longer to any of this uh, potential or potentiality? That's one. Uh, and, and the other question is about more about the institution is that I'm trying to figure this out, uh, which is that many institutions are now, many 
this world is being all experimented, no? I mean, there's a, there's a massive degree of experimentation, experimentality, and, and, and opening to failures, and, and et cetera, et cetera. But it, what, what, is the, what is the invisible core of the institution? What does the institution really want to do? And how experimentality refers to that core, that, that irreducible thing that, is, that an institution would imagine that it, that it would do for itself. Like not, this is not a generalized core. This one is not a general question. It's a rather specific question. Because I think of experimentality as a for, as a sort of formalist trope, uh, precisely a neoliberal trope at the moment, not uh, not what I think of experimentality this way, but it has become kind of a conceit, you know, we experiment. So if you keep on experimenting with the institution, uh, you know, do, do, it, do, it, do, it, do it do a different thing every day, what are you really doing as an institution? Where is the institution there? And, and uh, because it's, and coupled with that is the idea of kind of uh, handing over responsibility or sharing responsibility, something like that, you said this, yeah? Uh, but what do we mean by that? What are, what are we handing over? And what is it that we have that we're handing over, if we have anything? And what we, how is that what we have defined? And what are the uh, sets of uh, responsibilities and counter responsibilities as well? Because we imagine, I imagine that the only thing we can be think we imagine we have is public trust, which is very dubious at the moment. Anyway. I, I think, uh, sorry, uh, I think your second question relates to your first, actually, <laughs> uh, for, for me. Um, I would say that the interesting thing with situations is it, it's moved from an individual individual's practice, my, my curatorial practice, if you like, to becoming an institution. Okay? So in that moment of transition, you find yourself defining who are we for? What is this? As an institution, how is it more than my own individual objectives, set of objectives? So we now have a board of trustees, a mission, a vision, a business plan, etc., etc. And But I think what, what's, what's core to what you're saying is, um, what is our public benefit? What is our mission of the situation? What are, we, what are we trying to do? And I think it's the belief that artists can help to change the way in which we live our life um, as a fundamental um, belief, and that uh, situations can help to create space and opportunity for that to happen and produce knowledge and learn, okay, as a sort of fundamental mission. Um, so, I don't see, in a sense, um, our program or where working is experimental, particularly. I don't think we're testing out ways of working, but I think what we're trying, what, as an institution, hopefully what it does is that it uh, adapts methods and modes of working and learns to get better to deliver its mission. So, essentially, that's what happens. When it comes to compromise situations of development and publicity, uh, there are lots of projects I could talk to you about where it has the projects have been way too compromised and failed. They failed as artworks, so the projects produced because of the, um, the restrictions placed on the, art, uh, on the artists have, have meant that the artworks haven't been very good. They've been a bit dumb. Uh, and no one has been happy in the projects produced. So I guess I would say, what future do I see? I think that part of it is um, is to keep testing the boundaries of what people think is public art and what's possible. And we have to find uh, more and more inventive ways to do so as the commissioning briefs to us get more and more restrictive. But what's happened, of course, is that um, the art world has been, uh, well, now commercial business understands the value of art and artist projects uh, to, uh, it, let's, uh, I'll rephrase that. I think people understand that um, place identity and place making can be enhanced by artists, I think. So in terms of cultural tourism, so they can be, uh, in some ways, brought into that very difficult uh, uh, process of placemaking. And 
and I think that's partly why I, a, a lot of what I've written in the past has been around. Um, I think I don't think artists are interested in confirming things. I think they are interested in contesting them. Um, and so often you find when you're working within cultural tourism that artists don't provide the very thing that placemakers and developers want to see, which is a positive image of place. They're interested in messing that up. So the question is, how can we create a situation in which uh, they're messing it up, they're asking a question that can become productive and affirmative? So that would be my future in terms of development, and I guess that's what we're beginning to try to do in our zone. Uh, and inch by inch, you know. I just want to take a, have another take on it. I think that the need for or not for experimentation is somehow, uh, for me, I think all art institutions are specific. They are part of an, an ecology where they are. So that, for instance, what, why Kusa Lushka became what it is was partly, or in a big sense, due to the fact that the situation which is in Oslo, that it was a need for a specific kind of institution that didn't exist. So, Kunsa Lusha placed itself within the ecology of the art scene in Oslo. And I assume also that sort here in Istanbul plays a specific role. There is a need for, for something here, and you can take that role. So that's why I think art institutions always, you know, on the one hand side, they always there is a respond to a local context, and on the other hand, there is a need to communicate beyond that. So it would always be a, a sort of sensitive situation in that sense. And then, that leads me to the question that you said that situation is looked upon as a film company. <laughs> yeah, or well, more like it, but, it, yeah. but do you play a role in the Bristol ecology, yeah. art ecology? Do you have a, a, like a specific local? Uh, yes, but it's very recent. Yeah. It's interesting. It, uh, only now, because we've got 10 years worth of work, anybody wants to listen to something that we say. But we don't have a building, you see. We don't have a gallery. We have a production office. A bunch of computers in it, and telephones. Um, so the role that we play is that we will tell them about Istanbul. You know, we'll go back and we'll talk about Istanbul, and and that's the role that we play. We talk about our project. You also, also commission work in Bristol. Yes. So it means you're actually active in shaping Bristol. I mean the city of Bristol. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> One question about the particular project, if I may go back to the project that you were speaking about, where you met the group of artists who said about kind of a temporary art school in the gallery space. Uh, when you were speaking about that, I was thinking, you know, another cynical comment would be that it might turn into um, a form of outsourcing the program. And I was thinking, perhaps it's much more interesting to think about, you know, what you as an organization, as a team, learned through that experience? Or was it mostly, the premise was it only about like hosting a project and that was it? I was mostly about thinking about that, that premise and also you know, what you learned in the end. Yeah. 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 Uh, something that I didn't say that is of big importance is that uh, the Kunstler don't have a summer program. It's closed during July and partly of August. So, and this is a time where the Kunsthalle um, has no activity, or very small activity. And that's also one reason for saying, somehow, going into dialogue with different artists or groups and uh, inviting them to, to fill that gap. So it's practical as well. But of course, it's motivated due to the fact that we find particularly this group of artists uh, interesting. And also to see, as I said, how they respond to the fact that at this time they were going to be situated in a gallery space where they usually been outside, and their program and the series of lecture always connected to this specific situation in Bjorica and was centered around development and, and critical issues that somehow is constantly debated in Oslo due to this development in Bjorica. So it also connected to our sort of aim or mission to 
keep a discussion going on, so the Kunsthalle becomes uh, a physical space where you can actually have a critical debate about the development that happens around you. And we've been doing that several times. We also invited artists to respond to this development physically. Uh, we have one artist who uh, took the uh, kind of contemporary architecture as uh, the theme and developed a project that did that with something that you could actually see from, from the consult space. So it connects to a bigger motivation and, and, and to our program. So it's not by random, of course. It's sort of motivated in, in, our, in our practice. Did you want us to draw things to a close, or is there one question? Yeah. Uh, I wanted to go back to uh, the, the point about the, about adaptation. I don't know if you're comfortable. Can everyone hear? Yeah. Speak closer. Speak, speak a bit closer to the mic. Okay. Um, I was thinking about a previous program uh, that was organised in South uh, called When Everything Will Be Free, and there was something called a slide actor spoke there about uh, something to conceptualize as Bukharaj, uh, in which uh, finan the financial sector would adapt uh, to the rules and regulations that were imposed by states. So they would always be able to find a way to sort of get away from the rules and regulations and still be able to make yeah. amazing amounts of money. Uh, so I was thinking about this, but it ne doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. Why can't we own this up and sort of use it as you do? Um, and so the flip side of this coin is uh, the constant revolution. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's not per se, but it's it's this constant change in um, tactical and strategic moves. And this is perhaps best embodied in uh, the public arts concept that is uh, outlined by the Green Rules. Uh, but of course, I think these rules will also change Absolutely. as they are being getting, gotten used to. Uh, so I was thinking, your practice is actually very much in sync with your conception of public art. Yeah, yeah, it's true. And and um, but I'll tell you something. No, but I'll tell you something really interesting there, which is that the response to the new rules. Public art, which is a little book that if you've ever seen, um, it's sort of been extraordinary in that it, 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 of course, it's not a rule book. There are many rules, you know. That it's a provocation of 12 thoughts, but it's quite interesting that I think we have lost, everyone is so terrified of taking a stand, you know, of, of actually making a statement anymore around what something could be or, or perhaps what we need to change. That when you do, make a publication of trying to put your thoughts into 12, 12 ideas, people go, oh, great, let's respond, you know, and it, it's, a bit, so it's been an amazing response. And it's, I've learned something from that, which is, which is that to, to stop being afraid at saying, actually, uh, public art for me is not a genre, it's a mode of encounter, you know, to make more solid statements about what it is that we're trying to do. But, but not be afraid to say, I actually don't agree with that anymore. Two years on, things have changed. We're going to move on and adapt to this situation. We, actually, we don't think we should be doing this, we should be doing this. So I, I think it's about being braver and not being so frightened about being criticized about one's own institutional practice. You know, being open and porous and, and learning, but actually, I think Vasek was sort of saying, to have a, have a clear vision, you know, not to be constantly experimenting. Put something down on paper that you believe in. Mm -hmm. Can I, I can present a provocation? <laughs> is it also the fact that these 12 rules is, uh, respond to commissions, not to public art per se? Because we should not forget about the public art existed also as, as art initiated projects, like in the 60s and 70s. Artists did public art without being commissioned. While today, these things are automatically connected. So that's something. Is it is it rules about how to handle commissions, uh, foremost, or is it rules about how to make public art in public space? Well, they're implicitly, as you know, they're implicitly written for commissioners and funders. <laughs> you know, if you're an artist and you read those rules, you'd be like, "What was she talking about?" I knew that years ago. Like, yeah, obviously. But it, it but uh, so yeah, it's it's but it's also. Um, 
I think one of the things is, is, is perhaps, uh, I don't know in this room whether if we ask everyone to put their hands up, like kind of, are, are you mistrustful of curators? Anybody here? Raise your hand. Come on, be honest. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> often what I, uh, if I'm talking to young art students, often what they'll say is, well, why do you need a curator to make a modern artwork? I don't need you. you know. and, and I'm like, you don't need me. Absolutely not. Uh, you know, artworks in public space exist many, many times without a curator or a commission free. But, but my offer to you is, it's a lot of fun to work with somebody else that you spark off, that can perhaps raise money, help you do something, learn create expertise, find networks for you, make something happen. And and therefore, it's an offer. It's not an insistence there always has to be a curator. So I think that, that dialogue can produce something unexpected. Um, I think we're going to take a break.